Welcome to Derngate in Northampton, the location of our first hidden treasure. And it's one that I can genuinely describe as unique. Because behind the door of number 78 lies the only major domestic interior outside Scotland designed by the remarkable architect Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Now prepare yourselves because he didn't believe in painting things magnolia. Now you have been warned. See what I mean? It's absolutely amazing, even by today's standards, and Rennie Mackintosh designed all of this in 1916. Charles Rennie Mackintosh was best known for his work in Glasgow, with its Art Nouveau influences. But by the time he was working here at number 78, towards the end of his career, he was moving towards a dramatic geometric design which prefigured the style that was to become known as Art Deco. Despite the fact that the house has passed through many hands over the past 100 years, plenty of original features remain, including this amazing fireplace in the so-called Hall Lounge, which has these charming little hidden cupboards. Down the side of the staircase is this beautiful screen. In the 1960s, the house was a girls' school, and it's remarkable to think that this screen has survived girls clumping up and down over the years. How many coats of paint do you think they had to take off to get this feel? Twelve. So who commissioned Charles Rennie Mackintosh? Just who was the owner of number 78, who wanted his early 19th century Northampton townhouse to boast such an avant-garde interior? Surprisingly, perhaps, it was a man who earned his living selling model engines. His name was Wenman Bassett Loke, who had a background in engineering, but started a mail-order catalogue for his models when he was just 21. Eventually, he built up a world-renowned model-making business. Goodness gracious me, at last, Davits, I have it, with blocks and falls, complete, fitted with ball head and guy plates. I've been looking everywhere for those. In 1912, he became engaged to Florence Jones. It was then that he employed Rennie Mackintosh to design the marital home. 78 Derngate was bought for £250 and work was completed in time for the wedding in 1917. If you thought the lounge was bold, just look at the guest bedroom. You wouldn't think that a man who made model engines would have interior decor like this. George Bernard Shaw slept here when he visited Northampton to address the Labour Party during a general election. Florence was worried how he had sleep. The great man replied, just as I always do, with my eyes shut. Just as well. In the 1990s, the 78 Derngate Trust was formed to carry out a restoration project costing one and a half million pounds. House curator is Sylvia Pinches. Sylvia, how much of what I see generally throughout the house is original? Most of the structure, the fittings, the windows, the doors, the fireplaces, all original. It's the soft furnishings and the decor that we've had to work at recreating. And how did you work at them? What sort of advice did you get? We've had the advice of an architectural historian with the firm of architects who'd done the whole project, but we've also had fabric and wallpaper specialists and conservators who've done research and sourced the, the modern equivalents. Now tell me something about the bathroom. Is that all original? The 
Bath is the original, which is wonderful. Where did it come from? From Wisconsin in America. How Bassett Lope got a bath from Wisconsin in 1916 is a mystery. Good heavens, how did he even know the company existed? Exactly. He was a great frequenter of international trade shows on the continent. Whether that company showed in Europe or not, we don't know. And a local firm were importers of all sorts of sanitary wear. I've gone through their old catalogues, but I can't find that particular one in it. But I suspect it might have been. What about the towel rail? The towel rail, that too, is original. Heated towel rail in 1916. I don't have one now. That's a wonderful, <laughs> isn't it? And what about the wall covering in the bathroom? The wall covering is based on photographs of the wall covering that was there and contemporary descriptions. It's described as sanitary wallpaper, which means washable wallpaper at that time. How, how very practical. Indeed. And we have had that recreated. Alison McDermott, the uh, wallpaper expert, scanned the photographs, digitally manipulated, produced the stuff, and it was only when we were getting the final bit of paint off the nickel-plated towel rail that one square centimetre of the original paper came really? fluttering out, and it was right. <laughs> and do we know how they got on, this man that made model engines and this avant-garde architect? Again, we don't know for certain. We suspect that it might have been quite a difficult relationship. Macintosh is known for being quite a difficult architect. Bassett Loke was Most a, architects are difficult. I'd noticed in my experience. <laughs> <laughs> but the way that Bassett Loke was very engaged with this project, there are five letters which survive from Bassett Loke to Macintosh, very much into the detail. In this room, for example, the drawings for this surround behind us, a couple of versions of it from Macintosh, heavily annotated by Bassett Lowe. What I want is pivoting coal scuttles and all the rest of it. So he was a very hands-on sort of Well, he was client. an engineer after he all. He was an it? engineer. It really is extraordinary that some of the finest work by Charles Rennie Mackintosh, normally closely associated with Glasgow, is here in the middle of Northampton. And it's a real tribute to its original owner, Wenman Bassett Loke. He and Macintosh together created one of the most exciting domestic interiors in the country. And now, thanks to the 78 Derngate Trust, who have thrown the doors open to the public, we can all now have a unique insight into one of Rennie Macintosh's last commissions. We're moving on now into the countryside between Northamptonshire and Rutland. Our next architectural beauty can be found here, and it's one of my favourites. Now here's some clues. It's three quarters of a mile long, built out of 20 million bricks, and here's the third clue. It's the magnificent Haringworth Viaduct. Otherwise known as the Welland Viaduct because it spans the Welland Valley. Just look at it, what a wonderful example of Victorian engineering. The Midland Railway line runs from Kettering to Manton, and the first brick was laid in 1876. The entire structure was finished just two years later. Not bad going for the longest brick-built viaduct in the country. If you like facts and figures like I do, here's some to be going on with. There are 82 arches, each spanning 40 feet. There's 20,000 cubic yards of concrete. And if the 20 million bricks were taken and laid out in a five foot wide path, they'd stretch for 200 miles. But are there really 20 million bricks? The red bricks were made from local clay and were made on site. The miners digging the clay got two pounds a week and the bricklayers got two pounds and ten shillings. Navvies came from all over the country to work here and what a startling sight they must have been in this sleepy part of the world. They were huge men carrying picks and shovels with lanterns and cooking pots slung about them. Some even had wheelbarrows strapped to their backs. 400 of them and they brought their families with them. Single men would take up lodgings in adjoining villages. But for families, two settlements of huts were built, one at either end of the viaduct. This is one of the original huts. Once a Navi family had moved in, they themselves would take in lodgers. Believe it or not, up to 14 people would live in something just like that. 
The cooking facilities were very basic, and outside they might have a pig or a hen. Now these were a rough and ready kind of people. Drunkenness was a common problem. On average, the occupants of each hut consumed 30 gallons of beer a week. Another problem for this rural community was poaching. The local gamekeepers were up in arms, but the navvies were often accompanied by their lurcher dogs, and it would have taken a brave man to argue with them. It's difficult to imagine the impact that it must have made in this quiet rural location. The influx of hundreds of workmen and their families, the noisy steam-driven machinery clanking away day and night, and then the effect on the landscape. This viaduct is a true wonder of the age of steam. Now, if you're looking for a location in which to film a major costume drama set in the 1830s, you couldn't do much better than come to Stamford. Which is why this veritable Georgian jewel of a town was used for the adaptation of George Eliot's Middlemarch. And forsooth, my liege Walter Scott doffed his cap at this view of the spire of St Mary's Church, declaring it to be the most glorious on the Great North River. What is remarkable about Stamford is that many of its buildings are so uniformly of one period. In many of its streets and squares, there isn't a single modern building to be seen. And when you remember how modern developments have been allowed to blight so many of our towns and cities, that seems to me to be quite some achievement. Stamford may not have many buildings that are later than Georgian, but it has some beautiful ones that are earlier. Because the town was one of the finest medieval towns in England, thanks mainly to the wool industry. And it's one of those beautiful buildings that we've come to see today one of the finest examples of a medieval almshouse in England. It has its own starring role in Middlemarch as the old infirmary, but in reality, this is an almshouse hospital built in 1475 by an enormously wealthy wool merchant called William Brown. In the entrance passage, we can see William Brown's coat of arms. It depicts the tools of his trade, mallets to beat the cloth with, and teasels to fluff it up. Now, the name hospital is a bit misleading. In those days, a hospital wasn't for tending the sick. It offered hospitality to the poor. William Brown's hospital provided accommodation for 12 men, known as beadsmen, and two women who were here to look after the more elderly inmates. The men lived here in this room, known as the common room, in small cubicles. You can see how tight they must have been by the delineation of dark boards on the floor. Each of the cubicles originally had its own window, and clearly this fireplace wasn't there. They were simply furnished with a bed, a stool, and a candle. William Brown often travelled to France on business, and he may have based his hospital on the Hospice at Bone in Burgundy, which was founded 40 years earlier. In return for being given a home, residents were required to attend services here twice a day to pray for the souls of their benefactors. The chapel can be seen from the common room so that men who were too sick to leave their beds could still take part. The altar, which is made of Barnack ragstone, has not lain here undisturbed since the 15th century. In 1925, it was found embedded in the floor where it had probably been put during times of religious persecution. 
Some observant soul noticed the five marks of consecration, which identified it as an altar stone. The windows in the chapel are some of the finest examples in the country of medieval stained glass. It's just incredible to think that they've survived virtually intact for over 500 years. Directly above the common room is the audit room where all the business of the hospital was carried out around the great oak table. From the 19th century to the 1950s, the residents wore this uniform and they were happy to do so. Remember, this was a place for the very poor, not those with a wardrobe full of clothes. If, however, a beadsman went out in Stamford not wearing the uniform, they would be reported to the warden and confrater who ran the hospital and would be suitably disciplined. This was the sitting room provided for the confrater, the warden's assistant. He would sit here writing up the daily log of events, including details of such misdemeanours. In 1870, it was decided that the small cubicles in the common room were no longer appropriate. And these charming Victorian cottages were built for the residents. The Windsor chairs, which are currently on display in the audit room, were provided for the cottages so that the new residents would have at least one stick of furniture when they moved in. The cottages were converted into flats in the 1960s and all are currently occupied, a tribute to the vision of William Brown, who began it all back in the 15th century. So next time you visit Stamford, remember that amongst the architectural treasures of the Georgian period, there's a medieval gem that's well worth a look. By my very britches, I understand there's another film crew in town. They must be looking for another star. I must be on my way. Imagine you were under house arrest. Imagine you had to spend each day under the same roof, never allowed to travel anywhere. Reading, writing, perhaps indulging in a little music, filling your time however you could, but all the time knowing that one day there will be a knock on the door and your time will be up. Such was the fate of one man who spent the final five months of his life here at Holdenby House in Northamptonshire. That man was King Charles I. In fact, it wasn't such a bad prison at all, because at the time, Holdenby House was the second largest private house in the country. And to give you some idea of the scale, the largest was Hampton Court Palace. <laughs> Holdenby House today is just a fraction of the size of the original palace that stood here. It was built in 1583 by Sir Christopher Hatton, Lord Chancellor to Queen Elizabeth I, and was designed to show off his exalted status. It would have been a stunning building with two courtyards, 123 huge glass windows and the most beautiful gardens. But Sir Christopher died just nine years after completing Holden and the property passed to the crown. The most poignant period in Holdenby's history was a few years later in 1647. King Charles I and the Royalists were beaten by the Roundheads at the final and decisive battle of the Civil War at Naseby near here. He was brought here to Holdenby to be kept under house arrest for five months alone well, with 120 servants. This room, the library, is part of the original Elizabethan palace and is certainly one of the rooms King Charles would have spent time in. In June 1647, after five months of house arrest here at Holdenby, Cromwell's men sent one Cornet Joyce to take the king into custody. 
Charles, who despite his predicament still enjoyed wearing natty headgear, refused to leave, demanding that Joyce show him a legal document sanctioning such an act. In reply, Joyce simply gestured for the deposed king to look outside. 500 armed soldiers stood in the courtyard. It was a pretty persuasive argument. In a resigned tone, King Charles I quite simply said, "'Tis well writ." He was taken away and finally executed in 1649. The glittering splendour of the palace only lasted a hundred years. In 1650 it was sold to a parliamentarian who practically demolished it, selling the stone off to build other houses in the area. Only the kitchen wing remained, along with these two wonderful arches standing amongst the ruins. The present Holdenby House including this impressive entrance hall, was built around that wing when extensive refurbishment work was carried out in the 19th century by the present owner's great-great-grandparents. It's a splendid house, one that I would heartily recommend that you visit, either on a bank holiday Monday or by appointment. The gardens are open from April to September, and as you wander around the grounds, just try and imagine the size and scale of the original palace. In 1662, it was said that if Florence is a city so fine that it ought to be seen, but only on holiday, then Holdenby is a house which ought not to be seen, except on Christmas Day. <laughs>